Good morning, folks. It's good to have you all here, and uh, it's a real blessing. It's lovely to hear all the announcements, lovely to hear uh, about the shoe boxes and the opportunity we all have to, I suppose, to bless others. Isn't it great to be able to give to others? I love to even hear how it was a blessing to hear that first firsthand, how it was a blessing uh, to someone. So absolutely wonderful. So yeah, I can encourage, encourage you all to uh, volunteer in some capacity. Go and speak to Cathy. Make yourselves available in some capacity to help out those who are a lot less fortunate than ourselves. Uh, so praise God. Well, listen, we're going to turn to God's Word at this stage. And this morning we're going to continue on in our study in the book of Romans. And we'll be in Romans 6 this morning. Um, you know, so far, really, in Romans, we've been dealing with, I suppose, how a person is saved and uh, a person's need to come to the Lord and then how a person is saved. And, um, and I suppose we're dealing with uh, the, the theological term justification. But today, you're going to notice a change of focus. Today, Paul, in chapter 6 of Romans, uh, changes focus and he starts to be, deal with sanctification, so not so much how we can uh, come uh, to faith, but really how to walk in faith, and particularly how to walk in freedom over the power of sin. Um, so this morning, I just want to encourage you, I really believe that the Lord has a word for us this morning. And uh, if you're here today and you know, you've given your life to the Lord, you're a Christian, but you know, you're still struggling in issues in your life. You're struggling with sin, and it seems to you know, cause you to feel defeated and discouraged in that. I believe today God has something for us. And I just want to encourage you to just be open to what the Lord has to say to us through His Word today, because God wants us to be able to walk in freedom over the power of sin. And it's absolutely uh, so wonderful uh, as we really just unpack what God's Word uh, tells us about that, walking and freedom over the power of sin. So why don't we pray and ask the Lord to speak to us just as we open His, his Word together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank You for Your goodness, for Your love. Thank You for this opportunity that we have um, just to look at Your Word together. And Father, we just invite You to speak to us. And Lord, we just pray that each of us would just be open to what You would have to say to us this morning. Just thank you so much, Lord, and we, we ask all this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, in regards to walking in freedom over the power of sin, it reminded me many years ago, I read a book um, by an author, Chuck, Chuck Swindle it was, and uh, it was The Grace Awakening. It was called a great book in that. And there he encourages his readers um, to consider this country road. He, he was telling the people, consider this country road with lots of twists and lots of bends and that. And he says, How, what would be the best way of keeping people safe on this road? He says, one, one method might be round every bend, and it was sort of a cliff road, round every bend. At the bottom of the bend, you could build a state-of-an-art hospital with the very best medically trained people. And if somebody ever crashed and rolled down the hill, whatever, the team would rush out and they would patch them up and they would, you know, get them all fixed up again and restored and healthy and get them back up again on the road to continue on. Only for maybe around the next bend, the person to career off again, flying, you know, and down and to be all patched back up again and that. And he says, sometimes people in the Christian life, in regards to this aspect of sin, sometimes are a little bit like that. We're not really paying attention to what God has to say. So we're saved, we're on the road to life, and we're flying on without any, I suppose, just consideration of what God's saying to us. And then we career off. And then we crash, and we end up hurting ourselves, and probably, you know, bringing hurt to other people in our lives. But, you know, praise God, we, 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 look, at, we look at Scripture, and we look at Scripture like 1 John 1 verse 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, He'll forgive us our sins, and He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's like, okay, God, you know, and we confess, we repent, we receive God's forgiveness, we, we get support from people, and we get back up onto the road, and we fly on again. But we haven't learned our lesson, we fly on again, crash again. You know, go back through this process and continue on. But Chuck was saying a better way would be if, you know, the council on that would maybe put up some signs at each bend before each bend warning people of, of the, what's ahead. 
and if people would listen to the instructions, that they would enjoy freedom to really journey on their, you know, on the road without this constant careering off and, and getting hurt and getting restored. And, 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 and the reason I say this is because that scripture, 1 John 1 verse 9, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us your sins, cleanse us from all unfaithfulness, is, is brilliant and there's truth there. But God has a, a better plan for us than to be consistently careering off the road and, getting, and then um, getting help and forgive, finding forgiveness and being restored and carrying on. Romans 6 is God's inspired way for believers to stay on the road and walk in freedom from the power of sin in their life. And, and sort of have that picture in your life, or have that picture in your mind. And it was very, as I began to read through this, it really spoke to me again, and it reminded me of many years ago reading that, the analogy that he gave. You know, and, and Romans 6 really does unpack some amazing foundational truths that will keep us on the road of life and, uh, and help us deal with some besetting sins that maybe have plagued us in our lives up to this point. And uh, so, so let's look at really what Paul has to really say in, in Romans chapter 6. And where he's going to give us some say, foundational truths here that will help us stay on the road Mark for us. So let's begin verse 1 together of Romans chapter 6. And we're reading through in that. So what shall we say then, Paul says? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now, up until this point, I should say, you know, Paul has been, I suppose, gloriously um, expounding the, the message of grace, just a glorious message of the gospel of grace. Um, that we're saved by grace, but not only that, we're to continue um, walking the Christian life in grace. And I suppose here now, I suppose he's answering the potential question that people might have. Well, hold on a minute, you know, does grace not give people a license to sin? Like this message about grace, grace, does that not give people just a license to uh, just fly on uh, and, and sin? And Paul's response in verse 2, certainly not, he says. You know, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And he's going to explain this aspect about being dead in sin and, and not to live in it any longer in more depth as we continue. But in regards to this question, this question, is it okay to sin because grace abounds? Paul just says, certainly not. So just remember that, certainly not. But he's going to continue on verse 3 here. And here he introduces the first of these foundational truths that I believe will really help us if we desire to walk God's plan for our life. And that there's a few of them here, especially if we desire to walk in the freedom of of the, I suppose, freedom from the power of sin. And it's interesting, in regards to sin, Paul just doesn't come and say, oh, in regards to sin, Christian, no, no, no. Don't sin, no, no, no. He doesn't say that. But what he does say, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, he says, no, as in K-N-O-W. Christian, no, K-N-O-W. And once again, Christian, know something, K-N-O-W. He doesn't say N-O, N-O-N-O, Christian, when it comes to sin. He says, I want you to know something, and it's going to help you so much. So what does he say? What does he say? Verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So Paul brings up baptism here. And you know, recently we've had baptisms in the church, and it's absolutely wonderful, isn't it, uh, to see people taking the step of obedience. And a well done uh, to those who did it recently. It's just so wonderful to see that. And uh, it's a real celebration in the life of the church. But in bringing up baptism here, Paul wants us to understand the big thing of identity. And it's identification. In baptism, 
baptism, we're identifying with Jesus Christ in his death and in his resurrection. And this is what he's, he, he's encouraging us to remember here. When we were born again, the old person died. And we become a new creation in Christ. This is what Scripture clearly teaches. And in baptism, where we're symbolically uh, representing that, aren't we? What do you do with, a, with an old person? You bury the old person. And so in baptism, when you go down under the water, you're symbolically um, identifying with Jesus Christ that the old person is dead. And we come up out of the, new, up out of the water, we're, we're identifying again that, listen, we're a new creation in Christ. We're identifying with Christ in his death and resurrection. So it's, a, it's an outward sign of an inward reality, something that has already happened. That the old person has died. And now we're a new person in Christ. And this is very, very important um, for us to understand here. And Paul's going to be elaborating on this a little bit uh, further, but the first point he wants us to understand is that we were buried and we rose again. We identify with Jesus Christ. The old person has died and we're now a new creation. So the first thing, Christian, you need to know is that the old person died the moment you give your life to Christ. And you're now a new creation in Christ. Know this. And then particularly in verse 4, and just as Christ was raised from the dead, we should now walk in newness of life, he's telling us in verse 4. So the old person has died. We're a new creation in Christ, so we should walk in the newness of life that God has for us. So he wants us to understand this. Remember, Paul is trying to encourage us and equip the believer to walk in freedom over the power of sin. He's saying the first thing you need to know, the old person is dead. You're never a new creation in Christ. Okay, and in baptism we identify with Jesus about this truth. Now walk in the newness of life. He's, he's encouraging us here. And this whole chapter is going to be um, teaching us this truth. So the first one to remember is that we identify with Christ, okay? Paul wants us to know that we identify with Christ. Second foundational truth, verse 6, that Paul wants us to know. He says, knowing this, that your old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Amazing scripture. Let me read it again. Christian, knowing this, that your old man was crucified with him, with Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So when Jesus was crucified, our old self was crucified with Christ. Our old man also died. Galatians 2 tells us this, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the old person has died. We've been crucified with Christ. We, we need to understand this. We were crucified with Christ. The old person died. The moment we gave our life to Christ, the old person died and we became a new creation. Amazing. What was, what was one of the results of that? That the body of sin might be done away with. That's what, this, that's what it's telling us here. That the body of sin might be done away with. That fleshly, sinful nature within us might be done away with. Now before you go, oh, hold on, Stephen, hold on, theologically, where are we with us here? Let me say it again, let me explain it. Okay? The result of this, Scripture tells us, is that our, our body of sin might be done away with. That their, our fleshly sinful nature might be done away with. But notice what he, what he actually says here. And this is very, very important. The translation where it says done away with doesn't mean annihilated. It means rendered powerless. It means paralyzed. 
okay? This is, this is important for us. So we've been crucified with Christ, okay? Crucified with Him that the body of sin, our fleshly sinful nature, might be rendered powerless. This is really important for the believer to understand. Our old self has died that the flesh might be rendered powerless. That fleshly sinful nature might be rendered powerless in a believer's life. Very important. It's, it's important for us to really grasp this. Yes, we still have. And I know theologically, you know, Christendom, there's different aspects of this. Some will teach you one thing or another. But Scripture, if you look at it, it's very clear in this. The Christian is still has a, a fleshly, sinful nature. Okay? And be aware of that. But it's powerless. Why? Because of what was done on the cross. Christ defeated sin and death on the cross. We, when we give our lives to Christ, were crucified with Christ. That the body of sin, our fleshly sinful nature, might be rendered powerless. Powerless. That's really important for us to know. Especially if we're here to say, ah, listen, there's just some struggles I have in life and I'm going to take them with me to the grave. Yes, I'm a Christian, praise God, but I'm always going to struggle with that addiction to this or that. Or I'm always going to struggle with being a gossip or, you know, fleshly desires of whatever it is, of lust or jealousy or, or anger or whatever. That's just the way I'm going to be. That doesn't have to be the way. Paul says, know this. The old man died. That the body of sin might be rendered powerless. Powerless. This is really, really important for us to realize. He reinforces this again in verse 8. He continues. Verse 8 to 10. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, that the life that he lives, he lives to God. So here's another point. Paul wants us to know here. He's reinforcing it. Death and sin have no dominion over Christ. No dominion over Christ here. And he says, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. So death holds no fear for the believer either. Absolutely not. We've already died. So now we're going to be with Christ. The old man has already died. So now when we fall asleep, we're just going to wake up. In the presence of the Lord. Death is no fear for a Christian. Death is no dominion of fear for a Christian. It's amazing. But just as, so death is no fear for us, but it also says just as sin has dominion over Jesus, likewise, sin has no dominion over a believer. Remember this. Really understand this. You can, you can almost hear Paul saying, Oh, Christian, know this, know this, know this, please. Really grasp this. You know, we identify with Jesus Christ in baptism. We've been crucified with Christ. Oh, please, Christian, know this. We've been crucified with Christ. In order that what? The body of flesh might be done away with. That sin would no longer have dominion over you. This is your rightful place. Just as, as death and sin has no dominion over Jesus, so for the Christian, it has no dominion over us. Wow, it's incredible. This is some serious truth that Paul's on back in here. But it's, it's liberating if we understand it. 
Because we go, ah, but there's just that, that one issue still has dominion over me. I can't help it. I'm just a jealous person. No, jealousy is a sin. Oh, I just covet. I just lost. I just give in to addiction to this. Or I just get angry. I just, just call it for what it is. It's a sin. And it doesn't need to have dominion over your life. And the greatest, the greatest lie of the, you know, the, the enemy draws, one of his greatest, I suppose, methods to discourage us, he doesn't want us to know the truth. What does Jesus tell us about the truth? The truth will what? Set you free. Let's say it again. The truth will set you free. See, the truth of God's word will set you free from that besetting sin that is plaguing your life. It will set you free. When you, when you grasp this truth, when you appropriate this truth to your life, and we're going to get to that through, uh, get to that as well. But the first aspect of, of all this is we need to know the truth. So Paul starts off, know the truth, brother and sister. Know the old person has died. Know you're a new creation in Christ. No, because the old person has died, the body of sin, that fleshly, sinful nature is rendered powerless in your life. No power over your life. So it's a lie from the enemy. If you think, oh, this besetting sin is just something I'm going to have to the day I die, that's a lie, and it doesn't have to be like that. Paul wants us to know the truth. You know, I, I really feel this, that if we fail to grasp this, it's a little bit... We were singing this morning about, you know, we've come out of the grave, Jesus has called us out of the grave, and it reminded me of Lazarus. Do you remember when Lazarus was called out of the grave? But he came out and he was still what? In his... What was he in? Grave clothes still, wasn't he? He was still wrapped in the grave clothes. And Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Like, I was just, that picture was, do you know what will loose people? It's the truth of God's word spoken. If we apply the truth of this, it will loose you from those sins. And some people, maybe this morning, or some people when you're watching this, you are still enchained and stuff. And you're singing about being free in Jesus, and you're still in chains. And you don't understand how to, you think the chains are locked on you. But they're not. They're not locked on you at all. But you need to actually let them off. You need to walk free from them. God doesn't want you to walk about in grave clothes until he calls you home. God wants you to walk in the purposes that he has for you in freedom over the power of sin in your life. Your fleshly sinful nature has been rendered powerless because of the cross. Jesus broke, he paid the penalty for our sin and he broke the power of sin on the cross. That is available now for every single person to avail of. Paul's first point continually was no, 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 know those truths. Now, look at what he says here. This is very important for us, the next step to the. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, likewise, you also reckon yourselves. And it's that term reckon. And it's, uh, it's really here, it's an accounting term. And it means to add up these facts and understand this irrefutable, come to this irrefutable conclusion. 
add up the facts and come to this irrefutable conclusion. Reckon it's so. You've got to know it, but now you've got to reckon it so for yourself, to your own life here. Come to this conclusion. You know, if someone this morning, for an example, somebody this morning was, I don't know, struggling with paying their rent or something, they had no money to pay their rent this week, and, and somebody, you know, they shared that, and somebody very generously gave them a check, says, listen, I've been blessed this week, let them a check. He says, be blessed, you know. And you went home and you had that in your pocket. And you're going, yeah, 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 you know, I'm really struggling with rent this week, you know, and, and I know I've got a check in my pocket. But you don't go any further with it. You're not going to reap the benefits of it, are you, if it's just a check in your pocket? Oh, yeah, I know I have a check in the pocket, but, you know, I have no money in the bank. And, and uh, yeah, I'm really struggling, can't pay my rent, what am I going to do? And well, What do you need to do? for the transaction to, to benefit you. You have to cash the check. <laughs> you have to put large that check in your account. You've got to reckon it, so you've got to appropriate it to your situation. And Paul's been saying, know the truth, but will you cash it to your account? Will you appropriate it? Will you reckon it so in your life? If you want to live free, then appropriate this truth to your life. It's an irrefutable truth. It's the truth. But will you appropriate it now to your life and reckon it so so you can be, reap the benefits of it? Wow. Know what Jesus has done for you. And now start to appropriate that. And he's going to explain how we can do that now in a little bit as we go through. Therefore, he says, verse 12, Therefore, which means what? In light of what I've just been talking about. In light of knowing the truth that will set you free. Knowing the truth that, um, that we're identified with Christ. We've been crucified with Christ. That the body of sin has been done away with. It's rendered powerless in our life. Sin has no dominion over my life anymore. You know, knowing all these truths. Therefore, in light of all that, he says... Do not let sin reign, verse 12, in your mortal body that you shall bear it in its loss. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. So, Regardless of how entrenched your sinful habits are up to this point, when you're next tempted to give in to anger or jealousy or, or lust or gossip or whatever it is in your life, rather than presenting yourself to sin, Paul says, make a choice. Present yourself to God. Make the choice. You have a choice. You say, oh, no, no, I don't have a choice. I'm just addicted. That's a lie. You have a choice. Sin has been rendered powerless in your life. Your sin nature has been rendered powerless in your life. Oh, no, Steve, you just don't understand. I just fly off the temper, fly off the handle every time. You don't have to. No, it's just the way I am, Steve. I just, I'm jealous. I'm just a jealous person. I'm just a gossip, Steve. I'll never change. It's a choice. Previously, we were slaves to sin. We had no choice. Paul told us we were slaves to sin, so we served our old taskmaster. We had no choice. But that person died. That person was crucified with Christ. That person is dead. We are now a new creation in Christ who desires to walk righteously and can walk righteously and in holiness. Why? Because although the sinful flesh may yell at us and entice us and everything else, it has no power to make us obey the old habits any longer. It's been rendered powerless. Do we understand that? It's really important that we do. So 
Rather than presenting yourself to sin when the opportunity arises, instead present yourself to God. Turn to him and cry out to him at that moment. Start just where you're at. Cry out to him in that moment. And, you know, just there and then confess and repent to God. Just right in that moment. And, um, you know, repent of the temptation to gossip, the temptation to get anger, the temptation to, to give in to lust or addictions or whatever it is. Confess and repent at that moment and ask God to help you walk in the freedom that he has given you. He's given you freedom. Ask him now for the strength to walk in it. No longer listen to the lies of the enemy that we have no option. You're no longer a slave to your old taskmaster. Now make yourself a slave to God. Present yourself to God. You know, James 4 verse 7 talks about, you know, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The key to resisting the devil's schemes is in submitting ourselves, presenting ourselves to God. Submit to God. Present yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. It's really important for us to know this. Know that sin has no dominion over us. Know that Jesus has defeated the power, not only paid the penalty, he's defeated the power of sin, the cross. Appropriate it to our lives, to our situations, and present ourselves to God. Present ourselves to him to live righteously for him. We'll be submitting to God, resisting the devil's schemes here. Paul goes on to explain this verse 15. About this whole thing of slavery and that. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. So again, Paul's just, you know, he's saying it right out there. Listen, grace no way gives us a license to sin. Certainly not. Verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though we were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you, to which you were delivered. So although they were formerly slaves of sin, what does he say here? They have now obeyed from the heart. And I, I love this. So it's not just a head knowledge that they have now. They've obeyed. It's a heart obedience. And it's so important like that we talk about stuff. Yes, you read stuff. You, you hear about it. And it's a head knowledge. But it has to move to a heart obedience. That's the appropriate in something. Head knowledge to heart obedience. If you want to walk in freedom, it has to be a heart obedience. Just choose to obey. And experience the, the obedience God has promised. So what does he say here? What have they obeyed from the heart? This is good here. That form or that mold of doctrine, it says here, into which you were delivered. You know, the word, the word form here in the, the original language, it describes a mold used to, I suppose, shape molten metal. And you just think of that. You know, the idea that God wants to mold us, to shape us. And I suppose the idea is that for, when God does that, often he'll, he'll melt us with the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God working in our lives. And he'll melt us and put us into his mold and he'll shape us after himself. He'll shape us according to his truth. So that form, what was I talking about there? That form or that mold of doctrine into which you were delivered. We didn't believe this originally. But God wants to Burn away the wrong ideas. And he wants to now put us into the mold where we understand his truth and that we'll live right for him. We'll stay on the road, 
that he has for us. We'll not constantly be crashing off, hurting ourselves and hurting others. But rather now he wants to pour us into the mold and shape us after himself. It's wonderful here. I, th- I, th- I was just thinking about this, that form of doctrine, that mold of doctrine, reminded me of um, Romans, Romans 12, where Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. So the, the first thing there is to present, remember? No longer present yourself to sin, the old way of thinking. Present yourself to God. Submit to God. Present yourself to Him. Okay, God, I present myself to you. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Wow. So we're, we're to be melted down and poured into God's mold of truth now. God wants, God wants to shape us according to His truth That will be people understanding his truth. We'll obey his truth. Obey that form of doctrine. We'll we'll obey God's truth. We'll no longer present ourselves to sin, thinking we have an excuse to do so. We have no excuse. We don't need to. Satan's a liar. Instead, present yourselves to God. Submit to be put into God's mold of truth, of his doctrine of his truth, that you can be free in Christ. Free from that temper. Free from that lust. Free from that addiction to whatever it is. You can walk free. Jesus Christ on the cross broke the power of sin in your life. Praise God. It's absolutely wonderful. It really is absolutely wonderful. Verse 18, he says, And having been set free... From sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members of slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So previously we presented ourselves as slaves to sin, which led to you know, ever more sinful practices. But now, he says, present yourselves in the service of God. Just beautiful. Verse 20, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. You know, to walk in victory, another aspect here, to walk in victory over sin in your life, you have to be truthful and honest about what's the fruit of it. What's going to be the fruit of the sin? And those, what's going to be the result of it? And be honest. Not just the immediate, the immediacy of it. It's what's, what's the long-term fruit that's going to produce in your life? It's not going to be helpful. Sin brings death. You know, I think of even, say, the prodigal son, you know, as, as an example. Um, you know, he was somebody who, who wanted his freedom. He left home, and, uh, but he ended up enslaved. Worse than he ever could have imagined. It was only when he came home that he, he really entered into that freedom again that the Father had always for him. And, uh, and so often we can be like that. We can, we can be like the prodigal son. I know better. I want my freedom. You know, and and we, we end up hurting ourselves. I suppose just be careful. Like, don't... Don't let sin deceive ourselves. You know, the deceitfulness of sin here, it'll always bring death. It'll bring death to uh, your spiritual fervor as a a believer. It'll bring death to, you know, relationships. It can bring death to opportunities. uh, Sin will bring death. You know, there's consequences to sin and to remaining in that, uh, remaining in, I suppose, in a sinful behavior which we don't need to. But the warning is there, sin brings death. But verse 22, he says, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. So here's the, here's the, I suppose the opposite to the prodigal son, doesn't it, heading off. He says, you know, the one who submitted to Christ will be just fruit to holiness and the end will be everlasting life. 
incredible. Then the wages of sin is death. He repeats that truth again. Verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's interesting, you know, we tend to always quote that verse in relation to salvation. And we kind of, we quote it in relation to non-Christians. Oh yeah, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But Paul actually is writing this to the church in Rome. And, and there's an aspect I think there that maybe we could also, also learn as believers and take heed from. Again, even in the believer's life, the wages of sin will be death. It will, it'll bring death, as I talked about, um, in our lives. It'll bring death in your spiritual fervor. and It can bring death to aspects of ministry and relationships and opportunities and everything else. Um, I suppose the, we talked about, was it one of the midweeks, where we talked about uh, the fruit that lasts, you know, the, the good fruit, as opposed to stuff that is just burned up. And I think it's 1 Corinthians 3 that are, that are works what we do. It says 1 Corinthians uh, 3, verse 15, talks about if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as um, one just through passing through the fire. You know, we want more than just get to heaven as just people who've just escaped through the fire. We want our lives to count here and now. And Paul wants us to walk in freedom now. He wants us to walk free from sin, and walk in the purposes of God, being fruitful, carrying out good works, leaving a legacy of good works. That, that's the opportunity for each and every one of us. Not just as someone who just escaped through the fire. Yes, we're in heaven, but like, pff, man, I succumbed all my days as a Christian to sin nearly every day, like just distraught with it, beaten down with it, and my ministry was, you know, it was nearly non-existent because my testimony was nearly non-existent. That's not what God is for us. God wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to walk in the freedom of what God is for us. So while the wages of sin is death, praise God that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Oh, wow. Praise God indeed, you know. know that that there's God's gift and we've we've obviously looked at this in the first five chapters of Romans but we don't earn it salvation is by the grace of God absolutely it's a gift of God because he loves us and he demonstrated his love for us when we were still sinners separated from God ungodly we were without strength we we're enemies of God Christ died for us so he loves us and he done it all on the cross. Jesus on the cross took the penalty for our sin. And we can have that everlasting life by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. But God, Jesus on the cross, also defeated the power of sin for you and for me. And, and just today, folks, as we close... Just remind you, as Paul would just say, please know this. Know this. Believer, you identify with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. You identify with him in baptism. You died with Christ. What happened? That old person died. So believer, understand this. That old person who was a slave to sin is no more. You're dead. That person is dead. You are now a new creation in Christ. And know that as you were crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. That fleshly, sinful nature that you're still hearkening to, that you're still giving time to, that you're still listening to, it's rendered powerless. And so you no longer have to listen to it. You no longer have to give in. Yes, the flesh may have well-worn paths at the stage in it. We're just, that's, the, that's the wrong way of thinking I used to think. That's the way I always succumbed to temptation. I did it for year after year after year after year. And you may now need to train yourself to stop automatically acting that way. But this is what, it, what Romans tells us about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do, we, how do we retrain ourselves? We program ourselves, renew our mind. We are new. 
But now we have to start to apply this. Know the truth. Appropriate it to your life. Reckon it so in your life. Reckon that sin no longer has dominion over your life. From this moment, reckon it so. Let this be the moment that those grave clothes come off you now. Whatever chains, this be the moment that they fall away. And you walk in the of life that Paul says we are to walk in. No longer slaves to sin, but walk in newness of life. Make a choice today. Present yourself to God. God, here I am. I'm just presenting myself to you. I'm no longer presenting myself to sin. I'm presenting myself to you. Will you help me? Help me appropriate the truth that I now know. Praise God for your word. Thank the Lord for his word. Now we know the truth. As we appropriate it, it'll set us free. Come on, let's stand.